Welcome everyone to Bringing the Collective Together, Non-Human Animals, Humans, and Practice at the University. Sincere thanks once again to Green College for enabling this scholarly discussion. And sincere thanks to today's panelists. I'm Laura Genera. I'm from the Political Science Department at UBC. To begin, let us acknowledge that we are gathered on Musqueam land, where the Musqueam people have been engaged with non-human animals in particular kinds of social relations for many thousands of years. Today, in this current moment in the history of this land, the political, democratic, and ethical problem of how humans at the university see and use animals challenges us across scholarly disciplines. None of us is expert in all that is at stake. We really need each other for this conversation. I will then underscore that today's event is the second in a five-part series. And more, I would say, is gained by experiencing the whole series because we are working across these five events to bring the collective together. I will therefore briefly recap our first event, especially since it was so long ago, uh, and it's also available for viewing on YouTube. At our first event, Professor Rod Priest shared work from his 20-year scholarly study of how Western civilization has conceptualized human and animal relations. All human cultures develop distinctive conceptions of humans and animals, and Western civilization is certainly no exception. Professor Priest showed that in Western civilization, the ethical justification of the domination of animals was developed as an afterthought. Western philosophical claims about the human right to dominate emerged after the historical solidification of Western cultural practices in which humans dominated animals. Professor Priest argued then that not only do human conquerors write history, they also write the ethical rules that facilitate their cultures. Western ethical claims start with the view that humans are as a species superior to other species, this view then gets conflated with the claim that humans are justified in, in dominating other species. But even the starting claim to superiority is philosophically suspect, he argued. Each species has attributes that serves the needs and purposes of that species. He concluded that there is no adequate philosophical account of why human needs and goals trump animal needs and goals. The history of the Western cultural practice of domination is calcified in our contemporary thinking. At the university, ethics review boards are meant to evaluate the human use of animals with impartiality. But these ethics review boards are embedded in the prevailing cultural belief system. The review boards are thus partial, serving the interests of those already historically advantaged. We then heard from Professor Jody Castracano, who took up the companion question, who is the human in Western civilization? She showed how this category is also the product of history and power. Scholars of gender, critical race scholars, critical disability scholars, and others have been showing that the category, the human, is a political and historical thing that is open to challenge, including in the name of justice. Professor Castracano highlighted just how historically contingent the human is within Western modernity alone on four occasions, thanks to Copernicus, Darwin, Nietzsche, and Freud, the prevailing conception, conception of the human has been notably disrupted. The human is not a historically stable thing. Today, she argued, we approach another moment of destabilization in Western culture, we have long invented animals as a universal category against which we then define the human. They are that, therefore we are this. Professor Castracano concluded that today we must question how Western culture defines animals in order to question how it thereby defines the human. I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Professor Dan Weary of the Animal Welfare Program. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a professor in the Animal Welfare Program in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Uh, and uh, we have an active uh, group of students uh, and uh, postdoctoral fellows and other researchers aiming to improve the lives of animals through research 
and uh, teaching and through outreach. Um, and this is certainly a good opportunity to do just that. I'm also really pleased uh, to have such an uh, accomplished panel here today. Uh, just to give the audience a sense of how we're going to proceed, each of our panelists has agreed to give a 15-minute presentation. We're going to do those back-to-back -to, -back to leave lots of time for questioning at the end. And it's my great pleasure to start off by introducing Bill Nelson. Bill has kindly agreed to start off the session. Um, Bill is an uh, extremely busy guy. He is uh, head of the Department of Zoology. Uh, he chairs the university's Animal Care Policy Committee. Uh, Bill also represents the Canadian Society of Zoologists on the uh, Canada's uh, Council on Animal Care, which is the main governing national governing body for the use of animals in research. Um, Bill was also formal, uh, formally chair of the UBC's Animal Care Committee, so he certainly was. knows him. Uh, excuse me? Was. Was, <laughs> formally, yes. And uh, so he, he uh, knows an awful lot about the governance of the use of animals in research. And Bill himself is an animal researcher. So who better to start off the proceedings with the question, who benefits from animal research? Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks, Dan. There are some other choice seats in the back if you'll want to, no? So it's rare that I use notes to give a talk, but I will tonight only to keep myself focused because this is a topic where it's very easy to wander off and go in multiple directions. Uh, the question we're addressing is who benefits from animal research? And as a zoologist, I'm going to speak to the extent to which animals benefit from animal research. I think as everybody realizes, biology is the study of life, and while botanists to a large extent study plants, many biologists and all zoologists study animals. So all zoologists do research on animals of some sort, and if you were to ask me who benefits from that, I would say quite simply every living thing on earth, both plant and animal just as a generic statement to start things off. So can I back that up, I guess, is really what it comes down to. I know that most of us care deeply about animals, uh, certainly zoologists, biologists, that what tends to attract them to the profession. We treasure our pets, we visit wildlife parks, uh, we support efforts to save endangered species, we enjoy television shows on animals, movies in which animals uh, f feature heavily. I think that most would acknowledge that the health of pets and the success of attempts to save endangered species arise largely from knowledge about the animals themselves. And while it's easy to see a direct link between some research efforts and such tangible benefits, it's much more difficult to see the links between other forms of research and the links are not always obvious. What I'll try to do over the next few minutes is highlight some of the benefits that come from all the various aspects of zoological, biological research. Now in general that research takes two forms. It can be divided into basic or discovery research and applied research. And I'll talk a little bit about applied research first. It's a little uh, simpler to address and then move on to the question of basic or discovery research. On the applied side, we can really narrow that research down into three basic areas. One of them is research that's specifically directed at conservation issues, and then the other two avenues are those directed at animal health and at human health, biomedical research. Now in terms of the biomedical issues, I'm going to leave that for the other panelists tonight. That's more their domain, and I'm going to speak uh, to the other two. Now in terms of animal health issues, I think it's pretty clear that millions of household pets and farm animals uh, do not get sick because they've been vaccinated against everything from distemper, rabies, parvovirus, feline leukemia, infectious hepatitis, the list goes on and on. The development of all those vaccines comes from animal research. Many pets and farm animals survive serious infections without permanent harm due to antibiotics that were developed through the use of laboratory animals. Tranquilizers, painkillers, anesthetics, anticonvulsive drugs, 
uh, medications to treat everything from arthritis to hypothyroidism, diabetes, uh, were developed and have been developed for a host of species of both domestic animals and wildlife. Um, we know now, if we go to extremes, that pets can be treated for cancer, receive pacemakers, undergo corneal and organ transplants. Many pets that once had to be destroyed are now able to live longer, healthier lives as a result of the knowledge that has been gained through animal research. Uh, today there are over 83 medications that are distributed on a regular basis by veterinarians, all of which have uh, come to light through research of one sort or another. Wildlife benefits from this research too, both in the form of treatment of sick or injured animals that are brought into wildlife shelters, as well as in the treatment of natural populations for outbreaks of flu, viruses, bacterial infections, parasitic uh, diseases. Now on the conservation side, certainly in the last four decades, ecology has risen from being a specialized discipline to being a household word. With this has come a much better appreciation for the distribution and abundance of species on Earth, for how species interact with each other, and how they interact with the physical world, with abiotic factors. Most importantly, for how the human population is dependent on ecosystem health. Now, to quote from Wikipedia, that well-known source of information, <laughs> ecology is a human science as well. There are many practical applications of ecology in conservation biology, wetland management, natural resource management, city planning, community health, economics, basic and applied science, human social interactions. Ecosystems sustain every life supporting function on the planet, including climate regulation, water filtration, soil formation, food production, and many other features of scientific, historical, and spiritual value. Now that's the quote from Wikipedia. I think everyone can see the benefits of the research in applied ecology, studies that range from developing conservation plans to studies um, developed to ameliorate and limit, repair and mitigate ecological damage uh, caused by human activities. These also include studies designed to protect and save endangered species. What's generally questioned is the need to do invasive research, research requiring the sacrifice of animal life in laboratories to advance these causes. In large part, this arises, I, I believe, from a lack of understanding of the extent to which applied ecology and applied biology in general is dependent on fundamental basic knowledge obtained from all the other aspects of biology, from genetics, from physiology, anatomy, behavior, and evolution. All of these combine to give us the knowledge base on which applied aspects of biology are administered. So to understand how communities and populations behave, one must understand how the individuals that compose them function. This requires a detailed knowledge of how animals work. We need to know how they work before we can understand the potential consequences of climate change, ways to mitigate the effects of environmental um, disturbances, to understand causes and, co causes and consequences of outbreaks such as avian flu, uh, now a whole host of new outbreaks, things like white nose syndrome, which is decimating bat populations throughout North America, things like facial tumor disease, which is decimating the Tasmanian devil population down in Australia, uh, to provide medical aid to household pets or to injured wildlife. We see a huge diversity in the structure and function of populations and communities throughout the world, from biomes such as the tundra of the north to tropical rainforests, temperate forests, marine environments. Animals live where they do because they can. They can because of their unique physiological features. For us to be able to understand the consequences of environmental disruption on those populations, we have to understand what lies underneath their ability to live and function where they do, to understand their physiology. Basically, we need to look under the hood and see how they run. If we're to do a decent job of managing our global footprint, 
We require a detailed knowledge of everything from cell and molecular biology to the study of tissues, organs, and organ systems, as well as of individuals and populations and communities. Now, one of the saving graces for animal research in general is that most of the research, results of research conducted on one species are applicable to most other species. This arises from the simple fact that all organisms are descended from common ancestors somewhere back along the line. So that all of the differences that we see in physiology, size, behavior, shape, um, and activities to tolerances of different disturbances are derived from a common toolbox, from the genome. What we see in these differences is how evolution has worked on that genome to produce these differences, and particularly in differences in tolerance. Now, discovery research <clears throat> is another area. Describing the tangible benefits of discovery research is more difficult. Fundamentally, because by its very nature, it's not targeted at any direct application, but targeted at obtaining knowledge for knowledge's sake. This knowledge, however, no matter how esoteric, is the base upon which applied research is built. It's the resource that scientists go to when trying to solve practical problems. Giving examples of this, um, there are many. One of the simplest in terms of the benefits, in terms of educating a wide population, we see every night on TV. While most people don't appreciate it, um, the shows that we watch on Discovery Channel, the BBC series, all of those are animal research. They're behavioral, observational research with which people generally find no objection, but they are animal research. They give us a better understanding of animals in their natural environment. They give us a better understanding of the diversity within the world. And they draw public attention to the need for conservation management to preserve that diversity. Much of the discovery research, though, is invasive and requires animal sacrifice. It's not always easy to reconcile, and this now speaking from my perspective, our love of animals with the need for the responsible study of some animals in research laboratories. But this research is an essential component of all the advances that have been made in our field at all levels, including in terms of um, conservation management and applied ecology. Applied research works to apply fundamental understanding of how cells, animals, and ecosystems work. It's totally dependent on di discovery research of a basic nature. Now, I'll give two examples just to um, give a little bit of depth to the bold statements. Developing wildlife disease management strategies to minimize the impacts of global climate change on wildlife health is going to require a detailed knowledge of disease processes and their treatment. You can't treat a disease if you don't understand the basis of the disease and the root causes. A number of pathogens associated with wildlife could change their distribution and the severity of the responses to climate change. And these include what wildlife pathologists have now dubbed the dirty dozen. These are avian influenza, uh, blah, 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 avian, now I'm getting a dry mouth. <laughs> include avian flu, uh, babesia, cholera, Ebola, intestinal and external parasites, plague, Lyme disease, algal red tides, Rift Valley fever, sleeping sickness, tuberculosis, and yellow fever. These are the dirty dozen. Whether they're moving in human to animal, animal to human, or animal to animal directions, or in all three, further spread of these conditions jeopardizes the health of the world's wildlife and human economies, or human communities and economies. The discovery of polio vaccine is a fascinating story that dates back over a century. It's associated with a long stream of basic fundamental discovery research. In 1916, there was no cure for polio. In 1951, almost a half century later, after a 
decades of associated studies, many of them involving animals ranging up to monkeys, Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine. That then led to almost the complete abolition of polio as a disease in the human population. Interestingly, it was decades later when Jane Goodall was doing her chimpanzee work, discovered that that colony was about to be eradicated by polio. By sending human polio vaccine to Africa, the colony was saved and the population. So it does go in both directions. As another example, in the 1970s, we all became aware of acid rain and the consequences of acid rain for fish populations throughout eastern Canada. It was devastating. The kill-off was severe. The initial research to look into the possible causes of that revealed that what underlay the uh, root cause of death was a change in the permeability of the gills of the fish so that there was a tremendous loss of ions from fish to the waters because of leaky cells and leaky membranes. Interestingly, fundamental research that had been done a decade earlier had shown that calcium ions play a huge role in affecting permeability of fish gills, uh, the sodium, uh, potassium, and sodium chloride transporters within the gills, and that by simply adding calcium to the water, could counter the effects of the pH change, stabilize the membranes, and save the fish populations. And so liming of the lakes began to take place, and the long-term consequences of that are stable fish populations that otherwise would have been eradicated by the, by the pH changes. Of course, this hopefully bought time so that we can address the root cause, the cause of the acid rain itself, but in the meantime, the losses that would have been incurred have been prevented. So I want to conclude by saying that preserving the diversity that we see on our planet is a formidable challenge. One, though, that I feel, and I think all biologists share with me, that can only be addressed through a thorough understanding of biology, an understanding that comes from animal research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. That was a wonderful start. Uh, next is my pleasure to introduce Fabio Rossi. Uh, Fabio is a Canada Research Chair in Regenerative Medicine, uh, a professor in the Department of Medical Genetics, um, a member of the Biomedical Research Center, and also a member of our UBC uh, Animal Care Committee. And Fabio is also a researcher and I look forward to your comments on the benefits of using animals. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Um, so I'm going to take it from a completely different point of view. And um, I'm probably the first researcher that models human disease in animal that you have seen. And, uh, you know, modeling human disease in animal is uh, not so simple as uh, has been pointed out by many, many organizations. Uh, sometimes it's not so easy to get uh, the disease just right and to uh, do it in such a way that is relevant to animal health, uh, to, to human health. But if I have to answer the question that is the topic of this uh, um, symposium, who benefits from uh, animal research, I would have to agree with uh, Bill. Pretty much, I don't know of any category of people or le other living thing that doesn't benefit from the research that is going on. The problem is not so much uh, who benefits, but how can you maximize these benefits and can you reach a reasonable balance between the ethics compromises that you do when you do animal research and the benefits uh, that you get out. First of all, it's very hard to measure the benefits of animal research, but they are very clear. I mean, uh, you know, Bill has spent about uh, 10 minutes telling you uh, the good that animal research did to animal. If I had to spend the time telling you how many of the drugs that are taken regularly on a day-to-day -day basis have been uh, uh, um, tested, at the very least tested, if not discovered, in animals, um, we wouldn't have enough time tonight, right? And I think this is clear to everybody that uh, there are a number of uh, 
uh, dangers in uh, generating new therapies and drugs that are inherent in everything new you do, and that these dangers, uh, we mitigate them somehow by testing them on animals first. Now, uh, the question is, I think, of who benefits is pretty obvious. The, eventually, the sick people and their relatives and everybody that loves them, that does not want to see them to succumb to the disease and does not want to see them become sick. But the question, the, the real question here is, uh, do we have to do it on animals? And uh, is there any other way to obtain the same type of benefit? And so what I'm going to do tonight is uh, uh, take a few examples from my field of operations. And uh, my fields of operation are essentially, that I want to talk about tonight, are essentially two. One is regenerative medicine. So how do tissues fix themselves? And uh, how does animal research help uh, anybody in, in uh, fixing their tissues better, to be very simple. And the other field of operation is uh, neuroinflammatory disease. We are talking about multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer, things like this. And, uh, and this is, uh, is two very different topics that I think will give you a little bit of a breadth of the views of the problems we run into when we do animal research and how we address these problems to maximize the benefits and make sure that really the benefit is there for everybody and not just for you know, the people that have a job doing animal research, which is uh, very often one of the concerns of the public. So uh, the first topic is regeneration. <clears throat> the type of experiments that we do in animals are mostly have to do with the ability of skeletal muscle, you know, muscle to uh, fix itself after damage. Now, who could benefit from uh, a research that understands better how a tissue can fix itself? Well, there is a whole host of uh, 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 muscular uh, degenerative diseases. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is just the most uh, famous, especially because of the high prevalence in Canada, but I can mention a number of other diseases that you probably never heard that also rely on the ability that, that the, the mitigation of the disease relies on the ability of the tissue to fix the damage that takes place. In these affections what you have is a problem, I won't go into details unless you want me to later, um, that leads to continuous tissue damage and then you have the mechanism that the tissue has to fix that damage that kick in. They kick in and they delay the time in which you see the symptoms. Until those mechanisms are efficient, the symptoms are not showing up. Once those mechanisms start failing, then that's when the problems start. The tissue damage cannot be repaired. And when the body cannot repair, repristinate the tissue to its original function, what it does is it tries to plug the hole. It makes a scar. It's substituted with a hard, tough tissue that keeps things together, but doesn't, in the case of muscle, doesn't contract anymore. Now, all this we can reproduce in animals fairly well. Um, <clears throat> but there are a number of issues that we haven't been able to fix in animals until now. And there are a number of reasons why we can't fix those issues anywhere else than in animals, okay? Now let's start from uh, <clears throat> one of the obvious questions, why can't we do this type of experimentations in humans? Well, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne for example, affects people that are you know, probably the age of onset, onset is before five year old. And uh, um, it is considered um, ethically challenging to do any type of experimentation on a minor. There are people in this audience I know are much better experts than me at these problems. But the result of all this is that, in fact, the experimentation of treatments or interventions on people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy have been greatly limited to people that are 18 years old or older. At that stage, those regenerative processes that I was telling you about, the ability of the tissue to fix itself, it's gone. It's already too late. We cannot study it anymore because it's done. And there are very strict rules about taking biopsies from sick kids, and, and thank God that there are very strict rules. I hope you'll all agree. So now the question is, <clears throat> how do we do what we can't do in humans in animals? Well. 
There's many ways of doing it, and we have tried. Um, for example, uh, once the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy was identified by several groups, among which one in Ottawa, um, <clears throat> we went back to the animals and did something that you really can only do in mouse right now which is to delete the gene with surgical pre precision. This is a technique that cannot be done in any other, efficiently at least, or not be done in any other uh, animals routinely. You can do it in, in larger animals, uh, dogs, cows, it's not very well established, it's incredibly expensive, and quite honestly, it would be terribly impractical, and it wouldn't, you really wouldn't have any ethical advantage in doing experiments on a dog instead of a mouse. So there is really no reason to go that way. But we cannot do it in humans, obviously, as you can imagine, you cannot delete a gene that you know is going to cause a disease in a human on purpose. Now the question is, is it worth doing in, in animals? Well, when we did, <clears throat> we found that deleting the exact gene Introducing the exact mutations in the genes, and the genes are identical, the, the structure of the cells is identical, the, the, the functions of these genes in animals and animal and, and humans are near identical, as far as we can tell, but when we introduce that point mutation, the mice get a much milder disease than the humans. So now, <clears throat> you will clearly have a very clear benefit of doing research to try to understand how tissue fixes itself and responds to that, but it's not quite the same in the animals. And the question I have is, what do we do now? Do we give up, decide that this is not worth the ethical price, or do we keep doing research to try to figure out why? As you can imagine, it would be extremely interesting to figure out why there is this difference. And it would be just as interesting and useful to manage to actually obtain an, a, an animal uh, model of disease that can be used the proper way to test the right drugs, to test the right interventions, and to test something that we would be confident will work in humans. Right? And so the way that it has been done these days is that actually they found a second gene that acts together that acts together with the first one, and if you delete both of them, then the mouse gets exactly the same disease as the human. This took 15 more years of mouse research. Thank God we did not stop when we found the first gene wasn't giving the perfect model. I guess the message I'm trying to make is that in order to extract the maximum benefit from animal experiments, you cannot stop too early. Because science is slow, it takes time, and there is there are a number of examples in which you can eventually reach the point in which the benefit is clear, is predictable, and there are a number of examples in which we are not there yet. But, um, <clears throat> essentially, the alternatives are not there. You know, I keep trying to ask my students, some of them are sitting there to volunteer for this kind of experiments, <laughs> but <clears throat> how do we do acute damage into a mouse, for example? Acute damage means that we usually damage the tibialis anterior muscle. It's here, right? And um, then we study how it fixes itself. And clearly, unless you have something that's doing it, you can't really study the process. We have to do it, of course, in a way that doesn't affect the mouse welfare. This is why students would be better. They have a lot less rights than the animal uh, that we use. In, and probably cheaper, too. But... Um, <clears throat> But uh, essentially what you do is uh, uh, there's many ways of, of damaging a mouse muscle. And, uh, uh, you know, there's crashes, which are probably the closest situation to any damage that a human will get into sports. But the problem is that they are not controllable. You can't do it the right way. You, you have to, you know, it's going to be different from animal to animal. So to make a long story short, we actually use snake poison, and we inject a very small amount of snake poison in this muscle. And this is, you know, as natural as it gets. And at the same time, is it really relevant to human health? You know, how much benefit do we get from a model that is completely distant from anybody not living in the wet coast of Australia uh, to... Um, right? So... It is extremely relevant because the mechanisms that underlie all these processes are very, very, very similar between mouse and, and man. And there are differences that we still don't understand, 
But as it turns out, every time we think, well, not every time, but most of the times, at least in my field, in, 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 the, in muscle regeneration, every time there has been a major disagreement between human research and animal research, well, pretty much turned out to be that the animal research was correct and that the human research was not because doing research on humans is a lot harder. There is a lot more variation. You cannot use inbred strains in which all the animals have the same genome. For the same reason, animal research is somehow less beneficial to human because we simplify it to the point that we have to hit, really hit a balance between, you know, keeping it simple and keeping it relevant. Now let's go to the other model. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. You'll have time to ask questions. Let's go to the other model, um, multiple sclerosis. Now, we all know it's a terrible disease. You really don't want to have anybody you know having it. There is not much we can do about it right now. And uh, I must say that we, we, uh, our understanding of the disease itself has increased tremendously through a number of human and animal studies. But there is a but. You know, mice, which are the animals that we use in, anim in, uh, in MS research mostly, never get MS spontaneously. They never do. Do we know why? We have no idea whatsoever. Would you want to know why if you're interested in curing MS? Well, of course. You die to know why these animals are completely immune, right? We're still not there. We still don't know. Well, all we know now is how to cause something that remotely looks like a mess in humans. And again, the issue is, well, who's benefiting from this? In this case, pretty much only the humans, because the animals, a lot of the animals, in fact, and essentially every animal in the wild, never get to a stage uh, of disease that the human reaches. Why? Because if a mouse has anything similar to a mess in the wild, his life expectancy is much shorter due to predators, due to a number of other things, right? So we're not really helping animals, we're not really helping con conservation in this case. We are only helping human. Are we helping them a lot? Well, perhaps not much, but what do we do? We stop? Do we give up? You know, say, okay, well, we, there's nothing we can do? Or do we keep doing research, trying to figure out exactly what we are doing wrong? How do you get a better model? And how do you uh, uh, do the next step? Like in the case of the muscular dystrophy, where deleting one gene was not enough and you had to delete two. And this is a question that I really can't answer. I mean, I can answer it for myself. And obviously I have, because I'm in this profession. But this is a question that is very personal and everybody has to address it for itself. The one thing I can tell you is that even with this imperfect model, we have learned so much on this disease that we have already started testing therapies. Did the therapies work? Not quite. And let me give you the example of the MS therapy. Now, it's very clear that MS is due to the fact that some circulating cells that have no business being in the brain and in the central nervous system end up going there. And the reason why they end up going there in the first place is very obscure. There are a number of theories and we don't really know and we think that infection is involved and that the immune system gets overexcited by a certain stimuli that then cannot stop, carries on and goes in the brain, does damage. So <clears throat> we have found all this by being able to reproduce the disease in mice because we know that we can overexcite the immune system and the mice will get that disease. And that's a pretty decent model. Now, it, it's pretty logical and consequential that if you can block the entry of these nasty cells into the brain, you may be able to ameliorate the disease. And in fact, we can take an antibody, a reagent, that binds the nasty cells and prevents them from going in. In animal, the therapy works extremely well. You can pretty much prevent the disease in animals. Of course, preventing the disease is always easier than curing the disease, and in humans, that's what you have to do. You, you know, this is uh, uh, another reason why animal models are somewhat limited in their uh, benefit, is because very often we have to induce the disease and we try to prevent it, where in humans you cannot predict who's going to get MS, so you cannot prevent it. 
But this therapy actually managed to stop the disease in animals. It was gone. They went into human <clears throat> with this antibody, and they did a safety clinical trial, and it looked okay. And then they did the second stage, and it actually looked pretty good. The MS symptoms were not completely gone, but they were definitely ameliorated. Turns out, though, that there are some critical differences implicit in the models that we did not account for. And I'm trying to tell you the failures because I'm trying to give you the impression that these failures, we can address them and we learn every time we fail at something. That failing at curing a disease because the animal model was not perfect is not a real failure, it's half a victory because you get to the next step. So, in humans, the same antibody managed to ameliorate the disease, but somehow blocking all circulating cells from going into the CNS, you're also blocking the cells that have a business going there. And so in a subset of the patients that were treated with this antibody, they got viral encephalitis because now viruses that were present in the CNS and hiding were not under control anymore because of the lack of these patrolling cells. Okay? So why didn't we see it in mouse? Because in mouse, we can induce the disease, but the disease lasts about 10 days. It goes, it becomes as bad as it is in human, it lasts at that level perhaps for 24, 48 hours, and then it goes back. They remit, they get better. And in order to see the reactivation of a viral encephalitis, you have to treat the people for months, right? So you can see how it, could com it, it was completely not predictable with the animal model that we use now. And at the same time, you see that we are on the right track. So now the next step is gonna be Doing experiments in animal models, we now know which are the nasty cells and which ones are the good guys. And so now we have to go to the next step, only block the nasty cells and not the good guys from going into the CNS. We cannot do any of this without animals, none. There would be absolutely no hope for improvement. There is no such a thing as a non-living model for regeneration or for neuroinflammation. Why? Because they are extremely complex systems in which each element is different. For example, uh, we've heard uh, a lot about the potential of computer modeling to replace some of these uh, approaches. The problem we are having now is that when we um, build a computer model, we take, let's say, a B cell, the cells that makes the antibodies. So we measure the level of all genes and proteins and a bunch of other things in the cell. And how do we do that? We take a thousand cells, we put them together, we mash them up, and then we measure and we average. We say, okay, well, uh, you know, this is the value that each cell had because we divide that value for a thousand cells. Turns out that in reality, in biology, it's not like that at all. Out of those thousand cells, there's going to be like 300 different values for each parameter, and each cell will have a slightly different amount of that protein, that molecule. Now, you understand how much complexity that, that introduces in a computer model if you multiply that for the 30,000 genes that are in a cell, right? Each cell responds in a similar way, perhaps, but not because it has the same amount of all genes, same activity of all genes, but because the, the combination of them gives the same response. And to have that response, you need lower amounts of this when you have higher amount of that. We cannot model that. We will. I, am, I don't know if I'll be alive to see it, <laughs> but I am absolutely convinced that we will get there. But just, you know, I, I, probably a little bit off topic, and I gave you more of an idea of what are the limits uh, to the benefits than what are the recipients. And Dan is signaling that I'm talking too much, so I'll go back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Nelly Ellsberg. Uh, Nelly is a professor in UBC department, uh, UBC faculty of medicine's department of obstetrics and gynecology, uh, as well as in the department of anatomy, I believe. Um, uh, Nelly is a pioneer in uh, gyne gynecological cancer research and has way more awards than I can mention, but I'll just mention a couple uh, of, the, of the most notable ones. Uh, recently, she received an honorary Doctor of Science uh, from Simon Fraser University. Um, 
Nelly also uh, is a uh, uh, named as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and there was an award in Nellie's honor for uh, women's health research from the BC uh, Women's Hospital. Um, <laughs> have to say all this, Nellie. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And thank you again for willing to speak on the topic of benefits of animals research. I don't need to talk, you applaud it already. <laughs> I can go and sit down again. Well, I thought this, this session today, really, according to my instructions, has three subtopics. Uh, what is the value of animal research to humans, to animals, and how does it involve culture and uh, industry? So I will try, I'll, I'll be a little different, and I'll try and touch on each of these very briefly, <laughs> and I'll try and time myself. As far as uh, animal research for human purposes is concerned, I <clears throat> always wanted to do cancer research, and that's what I did most of my career. I was particularly interested in how normal cells become cancerous or malignant. But I very much disliked the idea of working for, maybe with animals for reasons I think that everybody here understands very well. So I also spent most of my uh, career trying to develop tissue culture models to grow and manipulate human cells. And I actually got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the United American Tissue Culture Association for my contributions to that field, which I'm very proud of. So I started my research, and I did all right. But there came a time when I had to use animals, and I did. And there was just no way out. And if anybody tells you that computers and tissue culture are as good as animals for research, it really isn't quite right. And I'll give you an example. You can use cells in culture and compare normal cells and cancer cells, and there are literally dozens of criteria that you can use to tell them apart, the way they look, the way they grow, the nutrients they use, on and on and on. So we took normal cells and we introduced different genes into them and changed them more and more and ended up with cell populations that in culture were completely indistinguishable from cancer cells. And over and over again, this was a big thing, and we were sure we had produced cancer cells. But if we put them into animals, mice, nothing happened. The animals lived happily ever after, and the tumor cells, our tumor cells just disappeared and presumably died. While if you took real cancer cells in a mouse, they formed tumors. And if it wasn't for the animal experiment, we would have maybe spent years of work and millions of dollars trying to manipulate the cancer cells that we had produced without ever realizing that they actually weren't. We don't know why. There are many, many possibilities. For example, tissue culture doesn't have an immune system. It doesn't have antibodies or cells that destroy foreign tissues. You find that only in a human or animal, etc. So I did it against my feelings, but I felt I had no choice. Do I feel guilty about having done it? No because I know animals suffer when you do experiments, but I hope at least that this suffering is much, much less than 
the suffering you prevent by producing more knowledge, more drugs, more treatments, and solutions for diseases for animals and humans. Well, I'll move right on to the next topic, is medical research useful to animals? And I must admit, when I read this, I really didn't know why the question was asked, because it is so absolutely obvious, like all the antibiotics and anti-cancer drugs and God knows what that is used in veterinary clinics to treat animals. Most of it was developed in, through medical research. And something I just wondered how, actually how this audience feels about it. Vet veterinary colleges use animals to do research to help animals. But these experimental animals suffer just as much as the ones that they used for medical research. Now, is that acceptable? I don't know. To me, they are just completely overlapping. The two groups contribute to each other's benefit. The third topic that came up as a subheading was culture, which I sort of translated into ethics, which made me think of a question I was asked by somebody in the last year, and that was, couldn't we do experiments on humans? And the, it was pointed out to me that humans are already used for experiments, and that would maybe be a way. So I thought I'll look into that, because it's an interesting related topic, and I found a website based in the U.S., but I guess it still applies, and I learned a few interesting things from it. One was that up, up to the 1940s, there were absolutely no rules controlling human experimentation. You could do anything, and it was apparently legal. And in fact, there were some very unpleasant experiments being done in the early 30s, 40s in the United States. For example, there was a famous case where experiments were done on a prison population which either had syphilis or was infected by it. And then they were not treated just to see how this disease would kill them, and that was fine. And the first rules that were uh, created to control human experimentation actually appeared at the Nuremberg trial in 1947, when the Nazis were being tried for experimentation that they had carried out in concentration camps. That was the first set of rules dealing with humans. And then in the 60s, there was a so-called Helsinki Accord in Finland, where the World Medical Association guarded and refined these rules. And since then, they've been redone and modified in different countries, and now it's extremely strict and in fact like I had to use human tissues for my research and you're driven crazy by the ethics people with all the th forms you had have to fill and questions you have to answer and on and on and on but uh, that's probably the way it has to be I was thinking were there any human populations that are a bit like animals, in that they don't have all the independence and so on. And there are two, really. One are prisoners, and the other are children. Both are sort of confined to a degree. And in fact, there are specific rules protecting prisoners and protecting children when it comes to experiments. There are lots of human experiments being done, but the vast majority don't involve physical uh, 
interference like drug testing, most of them are basically statistics and so on dealing with uh, uh, social problems, emotional problems and things of that nature. And of course the huge difference between human experimentation and animal experimentation is that humans have to give consent. And consent means, at least in our society, means consenting to have an experiment done on them and knowing absolutely everything about the purpose, the procedures, possible consequences, etc. And we do not ask animals for any of that. Um, I think I have another sure. couple of minutes. And I think I'll use it not to tell you something, but to raise a problem that has bothered me for quite a while. And that is, <coughs> I, if you look at how we use, and I purposely use the term use, how do we use animals other than pets? We use them for food, we use them for manufacture of clothing and shoes and whatever. We use them not so much anymore, but for physical labor. And we use them for entertainment. And I think all of you are aware of the suffering that many animals undergo. So we get cheap meat and cheap eggs and everything else. And I won't go into that. But when it comes to entertainment, there are two types that I find really bad, and those are hunting and fishing. There's, we don't do it, I mean, I don't do it, but people who hunt and fish don't do it for meat, they do it for fun. And there's really no excuse for killing perfectly innocent wild animals just so you get a lot of excitement out of it. And especially fishing uh, bothers me because there you, at least hunters, are supposed to kill animals quickly. But people who fish are proud that they play with the fish. They kill it slowly. They make it think it can get away that it can't. But nobody seems to say anything about that kind of animal treatment. And to my mind, using animals for research is the most ethical of all the animal uses that I can think of, because I think we all who do it hope that it will help somebody and relieve suffering, in contrast to all those other uses. And I, I'd be delighted to hear some comments on this during the question period. Yeah.